Cool. All right. Uh, I'm Sam. I'm going to be talking about Windows security. Uh, the alternative title for this talk is please stop using Windows 7. What year is this? Why are you doing that? And as you'll see later on, that's because it just makes life so much easier for the APTs. Uh, who am I? Uh, so I'm Sam, as I said before. Uh, I work in the research practice at MWR. Workwise, I focus on software security, product security, stuff like that. In my spare time, uh, company research time, I've been splitting my time between poking at Windows and effectively trying to automate myself out of the job. Um, it's an interesting talk. Um, this is going to be kind of a survey style thing. It's not going to be about dropping O-days and stuff. Um, focus on concepts, more of a systemization of knowledge type thing. Uh, this is kind of based off what I've been doing for the past year, reading horrendous amounts of blog posts and white papers and playing with bugs and reversing random things. Uh, as a reference slide for things I directly talk about, um, there's also a Git repo which has basically everything I've read over the past year that's been super useful. So I'm going to start off with motivation, saying why are we doing this, why am I here, what am I doing with my life. Uh, I'll then go on to talk about the attack surface and what there is to attack in Windows and how you interact with it. I'll then go a bit into bug hunting, um, what kind of tools, techniques people use to find bugs in Windows, how they've been found publicly. Uh, and then I'll do a run through of CV 2016-7255, which hopefully I have a working exploit for. It worked like 20 times last night, but it will probably fail now. Um, uh, which is the one Google disclosed after they found it being exploited in the wild just before Christmas and kind of dumped on Microsoft and there was lots of drama there. And then I'll have a few conclusions and you can ask me questions and make me look stupid. Uh, so motivation, um, why do we need to bother attacking Windows kernel? Why do we need to attack this stuff? Uh, the reality is that over the past 10 plus years, People have realized that if you own a browser, you shouldn't immediately have the keys to the kingdom and be able to do whatever you want. So we've introduced things like software sandboxing. Uh, so generally, how this will work, so for example, in a web browser, at a simplified level, your browser content processes will be run in a very low, low permission process. They will have to talk to another process which has kind of user level uh, privileges to call the broker process, I and mean, then you'll send it messages to do things like open files and things like that. This just means that the content process can't say if someone owns your browser, they can't directly start reading a file system. You can only get it via the content process. We'll do things like pop warnings to the user, make user select, limit what kind of things you can do. And then the broker itself will be making calls to the kernel. Uh, motivation. So IE7 kind of implemented the first public sandbox, but it was terrible. So I know uh, one guy, Fuzzy Security, did an entire red team while still in the sandbox, just because it was so, uh, give you so many permissions, let you still do things. It's got more and more effective over the years. Firefox finally got a real sandbox like two months ago, um, which is good. Um, and part of the thing that's helped with this is the concept of low integrity processes. This is a concept introduced with Windows Vista where you can have processes at different integrity levels. Generally, as a usual, be at medium, and then things at system will be at high, etc. Um, but low integrity will have access to very little. And once you have a low integrity process, you can also do things like restrict its permissions further so it can do very little on the system. So, sandbox escape, what do we want to do here? We've compromised a client, we can't do anything, we're stuck in a sandbox. We're going to need some way to escalate our privileges so we can actually do interesting things. Uh, so you could attack the broker itself, and there have been various exploits in brokers for sandboxes in the past. But it's quite a limited attack base. There's not a huge amount of functionality in them generally. They've been well researched. Uh, meanwhile, the kernel is monolithic and massive and messy. And every year, uh, as you can see from these kind of two columns, this is just comparing 2015 to 2016 in terms of bugs patched in parts of the Windows kernel. And the year on year growth is massive. And you can look back and it's the same with 2014 to 2015, 2013 to 2014. It's just a mess. So how do we actually go about in increasing our privileges? So I'm going to kind of go through what the actual mechanism is rather than kind of the exploits. It's okay, we've got code execution in kernel. How do we actually use that to do more? So Windows has this concept of access token objects. So in the Windows kernel, everything's an object, whether it's a file or a process or a thread or an access token. Um, so this is almost like cookies, but in the kernel space. Um, so this will say what you have access to, what permissions you have, what you can and can't read, what APIs you can call, etc. 
So the way we generally provesc is we find the access token for the system process, we steal that, replace ours with it, and suddenly we can do whatever we fancy. Uh, there's other methods as well. So you can do things like take another process, give your user more permissions so that you can edit the process and then attach, inject shell code, and your system keeps the kingdom off you go. Uh, you can also, so every object in Windows has a field for a security descriptor, which is a list of kind of who has access to it. So if you look at file permissions, it's really like system can read, write, execute, user can read. Um, so you can replace the pointer to that descriptor with a null pointer, and by default, Windows will fail open. So everyone will have access to everything, and again, you can attach injection shell code, you win. So now I'm gonna outline the kind of attack surface, what there is in Windows, what there is to attack. So, Windows is obviously huge, so there's a lot of attack service. I'm going to focus on the kind of three areas where most of the in the wild exploits you'll encounter actually target. Uh, these are system calls, drivers, and font passing. So, what is a system call? Essentially, in the real world, a user land application has very little permission to do anything. So, you're running in Ring 3, which is the less privileged one on Intel, to do anything serious, you have to fire off a request to the kernel to do things for you, and these are called system calls. Uh, so in Windows, you generally access these through NTDLL, user32.dll, etc. Uh, and these will be implemented on the back end by other binaries, which will run in a high privilege mode and be able to do things like mess with the system state. So there's kind of two core binaries. Um, they've been split up a bit in later versions, but conceptually it's still kind of two core binaries responsible for handling these. Uh, first one, Win32K. This has about a thousand plus system calls it supports. It's got lots of very complex functionality. It was also written in the 90s, which is famous for having high security standards. And it's doing all of this horrendous, complex GUI programming all in kernel mode. Um, uh, Microsoft's quite honest about how much of an issue this is. This is taken from a Microsoft job posting. Uh, it's one of our components, win32k.sys. It's the vector for 60% or more of all kernel mode Windows exploits. And it's a topic of white papers at Black Hat every year. So we're at the cutting edge of fixing vulnerabilities as well as developing mitigations. So we've truly embraced their leading position in the kernel exploit market. <laughs> Uh, meanwhile, NTOS kernel, this is the actual kind of kernel executive. So whereas Win32K manages the GUI and stuff like that, NTOS kernel provides kind of the core kernel functionality. So this is processes, threads, virtual memory, um, kind of everything you need for the system to actually run. Uh, so this has a much lower system call count than Win32K. It's also not doing things like graphics processing, which are finicky and complex. So kind of as a consequence, there's been a lot less public vulnerabilities in this. Um, however, it's still a huge code base, so there's still stuff to be found. Drivers, uh, these are used by Windows to uh, provide an interface for the user to things like hardware. They'll also be used by firmware updaters to update things like BIOS, UEFI firmware. Antivirus will use them to do things like stop you killing their userland process or to pass executables, because why not? Um, they'll also be used by, say, anti-cheat to make sure that you're not hooking a user land process and making sure you always have 100% health. So there's many ways to talk to drivers. Uh, most of the bugs have been in two core components. Uh, the first one of these are input-output controls. This is effectively where you can send a message to the driver and it will run a function on that. You kind of send it a number which identifies which IO control code it is. You also send it a pointer to an input buffer, how long that buffer is, a pointer to an output buffer, how long that buffer is and then it will go off and do things on that. Uh, there's also shared memory you can allocate, which is where you'll have a shared memory region that user space can write to, the driver can read from directly, and this kind of allows you to do faster data transfer between the two, um, especially if you're doing, say, if you're, say a GPU driver or something like that. Um, sadly, third-party drivers do terrible, terrible things. So in this picture, this is a collection of four drivers um, kind of found publicly described and did a quick reverse of. Uh, you don't really need to understand what's going on here. The key thing is that the boxes highlighted in green are the key things the driver needs just to kind of exist. Uh, the boxes in red are things which completely break the Windows security model. Um, quite kindly, there's also signed copies of these. So uh, MSI have signed three of them. Asus have another one signed. Um, otherwise, you always load them on the system. They'll do things like let you read, write any memory. 
which is nice and handy. Uh, font parsing. Uh, an interesting here is it turns out fonts are actually mentally complex. Um, they'll include things like small instruction sets used to describe how to render the font and stuff like that. These, again, are implemented by Win32K and managed by that. And traditionally in Windows, they've mostly been done in kernel mode. Um, so you're doing this kind of complex graphic type operations and running this small instruction set, but you're doing it all in kernel mode with lots of privileges. So I'll talk a bit now about bug hunting and how people kind of look for bugs in kernel code, kind of how we do it. Uh, first off, kernel fuzzing. Um, this is something MWR loves so much. We've done it three times on three different countries and worded it slightly different each time. Um, so we've also open sourced one of these, which you can go play of. Um, these are all kind of generally focused on fuzzing Win32K um, because it's low hanging fruit, it's an easy target, it's kind of where all the bugs live. So what does kernel fuzzing actually entail? Uh, so generally, you'll have reverse engineered a bunch of system calls, library calls, worked out how they work, what arguments they take, what they return. So you'll generate fuzzed values for the basic types. So like if it takes an integer, you'll generate a random number that is 32 bits. Uh, if it takes a character, random 8-bit value. Uh, you then have a database of all the handles you have. So in Windows, a handle is just kind of an identifier for an object to avoid people passing around pointers and stuff like that because it's dirty and Microsoft doesn't like it. Um, so all the handles you get back, you'll save, and then if you need them for another call, you'll grab them from your database. You'll log all the arguments you've got and what function you're going to call, execute it, save anything it returns. If you haven't crashed, go back to one, keep doing it until you do crash. If you have crashed, the system dies when it pops back up, save the debug dump and your log. Uh, so Nils, who works for us, did a long project for Google Project Zero doing this. Um, there's some extra stuff in there to do with managing it and how he did automate some of the reversing and stuff. But basically, he found all of the bugs and just spent six months beating the crap out of win32k.sys. So we're on code review. Not really that applicable to Microsoft Code. Obviously, everything's very proprietary. They're not giving out the source code, et cetera. And there are the odd exception though. So this is from the vulnerability I'm going to talk about later. Uh, it turned out the actual bug was publicly viewable in the NT4 source code that someone had leaked on GitHub. Um, so you could just kind of actually do code review there and find it via leaked code. Um, so reverse engineering, doing this actual binary level. Uh, obviously the kernel and the components you're looking at are huge. Um, However, reverse engineering does help support the other techniques. So if you want to know what system calls the fuzz, you can have to reverse engineer them because Microsoft doesn't document them. You have to work separate yourself. Uh, there are some things that will help you. So Windows does have a, what's called a symbol server. This will do things like if you have a binary, it will, you'll be able to pull in some of the debug data. So you'll be able to get some things like function names, maybe argument types, structures. Um, for some binaries, they're a lot friendlier on the older versions of Windows. So like Windows 7, there's a lot more symbols available. When you get up to Windows 10, there's a lot less, um, which is why quite often people start by, say, exploiting something on Windows 7, then port it to Windows 10 where they have less public information. There's also a project called React OS, uh, which has been led by Alex Arnescu for like 10 years. Um, he's basically spent most of his life at this point just reverse engineering the Windows kernel, and they're aiming to do a kind of Windows-like environment that you can live in. Um, so if you're looking at part of the kernel, there's a good chance they've re reversed a fair chunk of it. So you can kind of go look at what they think that code looks like in C, which is a lot more approachable than unknown binary. Uh, but obviously, reverse memory does have some value. So if it's narrowly targeted, so if you think there's a problem area or something in particular you think is dodgy, you can kind of go in, have a look at the binary, see if you can work out what's going on. And to be honest, the kernel's massive. You're still finding bugs by fuzzing, which you can just turn on and sit back. Why bother doing all the manual work? Uh, third party drivers, like the ones I showed earlier, have been a good source of bugs from reverse engineering though. Um, mostly because they tend to be quite small, the code quality is very low, and they'll do things like map random physical memory into user space. Um, it just generates helper. Um, there's a few tools about to help speed up reversing drivers. Uh, I released one, NCC released one like four weeks later, and theirs probably works better, but I released mine first. So. Uh, again, you can also fuzz drivers. So once you've worked out what the I.O. control codes discussed before are, you can plug them into a fuzzer. 
and let that do kind of random fuzzing on them. Um, there's a cool tool Isaac Partners did, which kind of fuzzes these dumbly, but it does a lot of patterns that are common in drivers. So a lot of things like when you send the input buffer, they'll put the buffer size in the first four bytes and things like that. So it's kind of a slightly more aware fuzzer and it also does cool stuff like manage user crashes for you. Um, font fuzzing again. Um, Juru from Project Zero has pretty much been dominating this um, because they have lots of computers and he spent a long time reversing this. Uh, also, things like the font specifications are publicly open, so you can do very targeted fuzzing. It's, you're not just generating random files, you're doing it with a spec, you're looking at edge cases and zooming in on particularly interesting parts. Um, and he has just been finding dozens and dozens of bugs a year, kind of doing this as kind of a part-time multi-year effort. Um, Kind of a last way you can do this is you can do patch diffing. So Windows publishes patches, Patch Tuesday. This used to be a lot bigger back when like each security update was an individual update. So you could have to search through a lot less code. But basically you can take two binaries, get a binary diffing tool, see what difference is, go through, look for security relevant changes. Sometimes this is easy, sometimes it's just not even worth trying. Um, so for example, we can get some hints. So this is a CVE which was exploited publicly a couple of years ago. Um, this one wasn't too hard to find out because it was quite a small update and the kind of call it's wanting to there is just the only change to this whole function was they started validating this pointer they were previously using and it turns out the issue was that that pointer could be like minus three and then uh, by placing stuff in the right place in memory you could get code execution. So I'm going to move on now to talk about mitigations and how we've kind of evolved how over the years Windows has tried to make it harder for people to put together kernel exploits and be able to own the system. Uh, so I'm going to steal uh, Ben Hawke's taxonomy for exploit negations. So type 0 is a C programming error that can be exploited. It's no longer exploitable because you've added this mitigation that just stops that altogether. Type 1 is a weaker mitigation. Um, so this is where there's a particular technique attackers are using and you put in extra code that just stops that singular technique. Um, Type two is, say, you remove a whole feature. So for example, when Microsoft launched Edge, they removed things like VB script and J script because no one was using them for anything legitimate. They were only being used to hack stuff. Uh, type three is a chain extension. So in user mode, this would be something like ASLR, which means that if an attacker wants to exploit a vulnerability, they need to have an extra bug. So the number of mit exploit mitigations Windows has been ever increasing year on year on year. Um, I'm only going to cover a few of the key interesting ones, ones that make life hard for people doing this. Uh, Windows 10 is picking these up very rapidly. Um, kind of every time they do a major release, they'll have two, three, four kind of changes which makes life harder, ranging from kind of all of the types. So once upon a time, back in the day, um, XP, Vista, 7, Windows 7, 32 bit. Um, kernel memory has no execute, so you mostly has no execute. Um, so you can't just put shell code in there and jump to it. However, there was nothing stopping you as a user allocating some shell code, making it executable, and then once you use your kernel exploit, just point it back at where your shell code is in user mode and running it there. Um, so back in the day, if you could control, hijack the control flow, so up, overwrite EIP somewhere, point it back at your shell code. If you've got a uh, write condition where you can say control what value you can write to any location in memory, you look for something like a function table, update one of the function pointers, tr cause the function to be called, your shell code to get run instead, uh, and then if you're good, you'll replace it afterwards to avoid blue screening later. <laughs> um, so Intel decided this was probably not a good thing, um, possibly with some input from other people, I imagine. So introduce what's called supervisor mode execution prevention uh, in about 2012. And then at the end of the year, when Windows 8 was first released, this already had support baked in. Uh, basically, if you attempt to do the attack I just said, the system will blue screen and for a fault and die. Uh, so now you have to work a bit harder. Uh, so there are ways you can uh, bypass this. So instead of relying on getting code execution in a system, you can do things like modify user tokens, as I said before, without kind of hijacking control flow. Uh, or kind of generally steer the thing, depending on what you're trying to steal. Uh, you can also do things like just pull out bit locker keys if that's what you're interested in. Uh, there are some bypasses, so back in the day you could use return rate programming. Uh, I'm not going to go into depth what that is, but basically it's you reuse code that's already there. So you're just reusing bits of code that's already in the kernel. 
And there was originally in older version of Windows, there was kind of a gadget in there which would just turn SMF off. So you'd jump to that, run that code, go back to yours, and then execute your own shell code and use the space again. This is getting a lot harder now. Um, so Microsoft has used Control Flow Guard, which makes it a lot harder, but I'm not going to go into depth there because that's kind of a whole talk on its own. Uh, alternatively, uh, you can just find a driver that will turn it off for you and not bother. Um, so this was Capcom's anti-cheat. Um, so I, these are kind of reverse engineer values, um, but effectively the logic flow in the only thing this driver did was it disabled this protection, executed, your shell, executed the code you pointed it to, and then turned it back on. So this is really just code execution as system as a service, and shockingly people weren't too happy about that. Uh, so next one, kernel address space layout randomization. You might have heard about this in, say, user mode with browsers, that kind of software. Um, this basically makes it so that things aren't loaded at predictable addresses, so you can't abuse the same object every time because that's always going to be in a different place. It was introduced with Vista. It has the potential to be the kind of mitigation that means you do need another bug to pull off an exploit, and they've kind of increasingly made it more random, so there's more bits of randomness, and it's even harder to find out where things are even if you have information links and stuff. Um, however, there's, in Windows, as a complex system, there's a lot of almost kind of by design leaks which bypass this. Um, so the classic one for this was an undocumented API called NT Query System Information, which existed to give you information about the system that was running. Um, but you could do things like pass this system handle information, um, it's like an enum value, so this will be, I can't remember the number from my head, but it's basically just an integer, um, but it has a nice name. Um, so if you pass this system handle information, it would tell you where all of the objects lived in kernel memory. Um, so this includes things like, also what process owns them. Uh, this include things like security tokens and threads and processes and files, um, which is super handy if you're looking to, say, corrupt one of them. Uh, there's also another argument, uh, system module information, you could pass it, and that would give you the names of all the drivers the system has loaded and where they're located in kernel memory. So again, if you're looking to abuse one of those, you don't need to bother with any kind of complex SLR bypass. The system's just going to give you that information. Um, sadly, when you got to Windows 8.1, Microsoft stopped that. So from low integrity process, you just get rejected uh, if you try to run this now. Uh, and the key thing is that, that means that it can't be used in things like sandbox breakouts. Because if you're going to be running at low integrity, you can't call this. It's still, if you can get a user to run a binary, it's still going to work. Um, but it at least makes people work a little bit harder. Um, so I did a long, long blog post on this. Um, so this is all taken from a white paper Juru did uh, about 10 years ago. And I just kind of went through and looked at how many of these have actually been stopped by Microsoft now. Uh, kind of a key thing to take around here is that because a lot of these are by design, Microsoft can't just get rid of them because it will break stability and they have a lot of backwards compatibility support they kind of staunchly stand by. Um, also, those question marks have been corrected by Alex on SQ this morning over Twitter, but I didn't really have time to update my slides. Um, so they're just ticks now. It turned out I was confused. Um, yeah, so the key thing to say about that is Microsoft is putting a lot of effort into plugging these and making it harder to get past the SLR as kind of a key protection. Uh, another mitigation we did was, so in C, C++, when you use pointers, there's kind of a really common programming mistake, which is, you dereference pointer without making sure it's a real value. So someone's passed in zero, you try to dereference it. In user space, that's not really useful. You can't really exploit that because you can't get anything in that memory range. However, if it's in kernel code, because you're a user back in the day until Windows 764 bit, you could map the first page of memory, which starts at address zero. The kernel will go to reference it, you could put data there, steer it kind of steer the kernel function towards executing something or changing some value that would give you code execution system. Uh, so another one, this was back up before, where you just overwrite the pointer security script with an old pointer and Windows would fail open and give you the keys to the kingdom. They worked for this. Um, so now when you go to get handle to a process, sorry, it's a process, yeah, um, it will do things like, we'll okay, is the security script the script field? No, okay. Uh, but not check, is it a process? And is the security required for that? Set? If these are all true, um, it'll just give you a view screen and everything will die. Uh, NetSuite did a really good in-depth write-up of this, um, which is where I stopped the screenshot from, because um, I don't have time to it myself. Um, this is a type one mitigation, it's just stopping away people were exploiting bugs in a very specific kind of circumstance. 
Uh, so another thing Microsoft have done is they've been removing functionality out of kernel space if there's less there to attack. Font passing has always kind of been a running joke about Windows security because oh, they're doing fonts in the kernel, that's stupid, why would you do that? They're now starting to genuinely kind of move away from that. Now, if you're, say, browsing into an edge, you load a new font, that gets done in a very restricted app container. Only that doesn't really get you anything, you just end up in an even stricter sandbox than you would if you owned edge. So at that point, that kind of uh, vector's completely gone away. And they've done that by just removing the functionality you're targeting completely. Uh, they've also started to implement a similar thing with Win32K. So now you can set some process values when you create a thread, etc. And you can make it so that it doesn't have access to those Win32K APIs, which have been such a good source of bugs for people doing exploit development for so many years. Uh, I'm not going to move on to give some details on the CVE 2016-7255, uh, how it's exploited, how it was exploited in the wild. Uh, so this is from the Google blog, uh, October last year. They found this vulnerability being exploited in the wild. They told Microsoft uh, after seven days, because they have a policy of this apparently, it happens often enough, uh, they publicized information so that people could be aware and protect themselves. Uh, and McAfee and Trend Micro both did really good blog posts giving details on uh, this attack by reverse engineering the attack binaries. Uh, so I'm going to talk through how this was exploited. Um, so this demo worked like 20 times last night. So I expect it to fail miserably now. Um, so I was originally going to talk through it while the exploit ran. Um, however, I'm paranoid it's going to fail. And then, so this way, hopefully, I'll have enough time for a, my machine to reboot before I ruin that. Um, so here, to give some context, it's just set up the system. It's done nothing particularly malicious. It's just done a bit of window management. The exploit's where it wants to be. Here, it's running the actual memory corruption. This is what's damaging things. Do some other stuff. Now, it's read a bunch of different kernel memory. It's found out what it wants to corrupt. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Every time. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> All right, I'll try it again at the end and hopefully, uh, if not, I'll put the code up next week. Anyway, <laughs> here's how you would exploit it um, if you weren't a terrible person. <laughs> All right, so there's two kind of key components of this exploit. Uh, one it uses is the ability for a specific structure, it can basically get a copy of that structure in kernel memory, which it can use to bypass ASLR, find out where things are, help guide the exploitation process. Uh, the second, the part that actually kind of corrupts memory in kernel is it has the ability to or any byte in memory with four, which means you can set a single bit. Uh, by combining these two issues, I managed to get system code execution on Windows 7 to 10 up to anniversary update, both 32-bit and 64-bit. Uh, so the data link was this undocumented structure called H structure, um, called HM validate handle. Um, basically, you pass this a handle to a window, and it was kind enough to take a structure which is associated with that and just copy it into user memory. Um, luckily, when it copies it, it also includes things like the pointer to where it lives in kernel memory, at which point you don't have to worry about SLR anymore because you know where this thing lives. And the corruption primitive is a bit more complex. Uh, you take a window object. There's a function on this which lets you set some memory, um, which is kind of used by the memory. Um, you could modify one of the fields on the window with no checks. It wouldn't successfully check you were modifying it. And then another function when you which can be triggered by tapping between windows. It's not the only way it can be triggered. Um, when it tries to find the next window, it will take that value and use it as a pointer. Um, so by setting this pointer to any address, you could then cause the logic to happen on that. And what it will do is it will set, take that address, add hex 28, and or it with four, which means that you can take any byte in the whole windows address space and just set its sixth bit. Um, so how do they actually turn this into a function exploit. So step one, uh, they create 
600 Windows objects. It could be any large number of Windows objects. That's 256, I'm pretty sure. Um, <laughs> it creates these. It uses the HM validate to find out where they all live in kernel memory. And then it finds two which are close enough together. Um, in their case, it was deemed to be free FD00. And then destroy the other ones, throw them away. You've got your two targets. So the first window becomes your primary one. Your second window becomes your secondary one, which is uh, higher up in memory, which doesn't make sense from my diagram, but it's higher value. <laughs> so the initial corruption, um, there's a value for a, a win uh, tag window object called TB wind extra, which defines how much extra memory space there is after the structure, which can be used to store things. Uh, so this is the kind of target we're going to corrupt. So to begin with, this is at zero, there's no extra memory. Using the corruption primitive, we can all the highest byte. So that goes from being a zero bytes extra memory to a large number of hex bytes. Uh, and that, the key thing is that this also means it now includes the second structure. So how do, so we have the ability to dick about with the second structure now. How do we actually turn that into reading and writing kernel memory? Uh, to start with, we need to get a read primitive. Um, so there's a field in a tag window, which is SP wind parent. Uh, basically, this is a pointer to the Windows parent window. So when you call the function call into user get ancestor, that's meant to return the handle value for that parent. Um, so by calculating the difference between where your spare region memory in window one starts and where that is located in your spare memory region, you can call uh, NT, yeah, NT user set window long pointer, overwrite that value with an arbitrary address in memory, and then when you call that NT user get ancestor, it's going to go to that memory, read 32 bits of memory it finds there, and return it to you. So at this point, you can read any four bytes in memory at a time. Diagrams. Uh, so how do we get a write primitive from this? Um, so we have the ability to read any kernel memory. We also want to be able to write kernel memory because otherwise we can't actually do anything that fun. Um, so the key thing is it has a tag window has a string name field. Um, by overwriting the buffer pointer with a similar technique, we find out where the buffer pointer lives on the second tag wind, find out the difference, use NT set long pointer to overwrite it. We can then use the function which is meant to set that string name that will follow on our corrupted pointer and it will go there and write the string we've passed to it at whatever address in memory we've decided we want to write. Yay. So now we've got the ability to read and write anywhere in memory that we fancy. How do we actually turn this into something useful? So another nice thing about the tag win structure is it includes a pointer to a tag thread, which is the kind of thread object used by winfect 2 uh, But from there, you can get the thread object, which is used by the kernel. From there, you can look at the asynchronous procedure state, but we don't really care what it actually is. So we're going to find this other pointer. We can read this again. Um, that has a pointer to the process object living in the kernel. The process object has these handy fields, a uh, unique process ID, which is what the process ID of that process is, a pointer to its security token, and a the pvoid active process links, which is a very polite one, because that means you can follow that along and find all the other processes in the system. So then what we want to do is we're going to traverse it, find the process which has the process ID of four. We're going to find its we're going to find its security token, we're going to copy it, and we're just going to paste it over our own. Well, the pointer to the security token, even. Um, and at that point, we're system now. Um, where's the screenshot of the exploit actually running successfully? Um, just to spill too many rumors. Uh, oh, I was get... Cool. Uh, so some caveats here. So Microsoft put out a blog post saying basically how they'd already mitigated this risk. Um, it's not going to go into depth here, but basically around the primitive views there. So things like the string name buffer, they'll make sure that that's actually in a sane memory range. So you can't just set it to anywhere and go off writing everything. Um, however, then briefly afterwards, another guy posted a blog post which walks you through bypassing those checks. 
Uh, so in conclusions, the Windows kernel is massive and complex and messy. Export development's coming harder, but it's still possible. Lots of people are doing it, mostly unknown government entities in the eastern part of the world. It's not going away anytime soon. Um, these have value, they're useful, and as long as people are able to put these together, they're going to be used. Uh, questions? Anyone? While I wait for this to reboot. Graham, inevitably, you're about to make me look stupid. <laughs> Uh, good question. Um, so, I think, if I remember correctly, so I think keeping it as part of the protections they're working on with Intel, also bringing kind of a whole raft of features. Um, so, we're also enhancing things like the virtual machine based security features and pushing those aggressively. So, I can kind of see why they've given up on Emmet. So, Emmet might still be provide massive value for especially like large financials running Windows 7 everywhere. But at some point, Microsoft did have to stop investing on monkey patching clients who are being annoying when they really want people to upgrade. In case you haven't noticed, they've been pushing Windows 10 quite hard. Um, and a lot of the virtual machine based stuff is pretty awesome and does raise the bar to mental levels, which makes me a bit sad because um, I'll probably be unemployed soon. Um, but I think it's something they'd kind of have to inevitably do at some point. So I guess they just have to bite the bullet and make people sad. Anyone else? Okay, I'm going to give this another run, and if it fails, I'm going to go have a beer and cry. What? Ah. Sorry, single sites. Uh, at this point, it's create the window objects, found who it's going to target, thrown away the others. And then it's used for leak to find the address of the CB wind field in the primary window. This is the actual memory corruption <laughs> taking place, hopefully. Hey, is this? Ah. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, I'm going to put the code up for that next week. I swear it was working earlier. You'll have to take my word for it. <laughs> Um, it will probably be on either mine or MW Labs GitHub. I'll tweet about it and throw it all over the place. Um, but that did was at the point where it was kind of trivially plausible to Windows 7 and Windows 10. Um, there's some cool tricks the authors did if you look at those blog posts to do things like avoid hard coding offsets. Um, so basically all we had to change between Windows versions was system call numbers and one or two offsets and structures that Microsoft only changes on major releases. Um, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I'll try to get a working demo up somewhere at some point.